And that's what Florence Nightingale, she wasn't worried about the germs that were causing all the people to get sick. She was looking at why they were there. You see that? She cleaned up the house so there's nowhere for them to eat. There's nothing for them to do there. And I remember reading in a Time magazine where they said there are, there's drug-resistant TB happening in some little villages in Africa. And so I read the story and the journalist was following a health worker into a little village where a man had drug-resistant TB. She was walking up the path towards the village and there were goats that were pulling the rubbish all out on the path. Note. When she got into the village, there was a, there was a shiny metal shop there that said Coca-Cola, selling sugar biscuits as well. Then she went to the hut where the man with the drug-resistant TB was. She pulled the, the dirty rag for the door aside. The stench almost knocked her over. She stepped in and there's the man with drug-resistant TB lying on a dirt floor. I thought, does anyone else see this? Drugs will... You see, drugs never cure disease. They just change the form and location of the disease. And if the money spent on that drug was spent on educating the people in that little village of to how to keep the village clean, to evict the Coca-Cola, to get clean water, clean sanitation, we need some Florence Nightingales around, yeah? Can you see why the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know about the Florence Nightingale story? You see, the, the carbon cycle that I draw you, that is the basis of the true role of microbes in the human body. So, as I just showed you near the end of the last lecture, that the antibiotics are putting mould into the body. They're putting um, a mould waste into the human body. And there's a huge area of research that's starting today showing the fungal aspect of disease. The question is, how does it get into the body? Number one, it can come in through your skin. So don't touch anything that's got mould on it. And if there's an orange that's mouldy in your fruit bowl, don't touch it. Because it can get in through your skin. Get some tongs, pick it up. Cover your mouth, put it in the compost bin because you can also breathe it in. I was talking to a man not long ago who was coughing up blood and he's had test after test after test after test after test and the doctors can't find anything wrong with him. Is there something wrong? Is there something wrong when you're coughing up blood? So I said to him, it's either exposure to Cigarette smoke or chemicals or mould. Did you hear that? Because what else are we breathing in? And when I said that, he and his wife went, ah. I think it was three years ago, but for a whole day he was shoveling mushroom compost. And every time he put the shovel into that mushroom compost, what came up? She said he was sick for a whole week after he did that. Mm -hmm. You see, if you don't find the cause, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner and there is always a cause. There is always a reason. I said, you don't need any more tests, you don't need any more big fancy names put on what's happening. You can breathe it in, it can come in through your skin, you can eat it or it can come into your gut through antibiotics and it can be sexually transmitted. They're the four ways that mould can, or fungus can get into your body. How do you know it's there? What are the symptoms? How long's a piece of string? There's a variety of symptoms. As you saw in my illustrations in the last lecture, if it was a mould off uh, that was grown on the rice, cardiac beriberi heart, if it was aflatoxin coming from aspergillus, it was affecting the 
liver. So there can be a whole variety of ways. But I think the million dollar question is how do we get it out? Am I right? How do we get it out of the human body? Number one, starve. Remember, it's just an opportunist organism and it's just going to hang around where it's going to get well fed. And what's its favourite food? Sugar. Sugar. So all sugars must stop. Yeast. Yeast will help it to develop. You've got to look in your house. Make sure there is no exposure to mould. Mm-hmm. No exposure to mould at all. We have a couple of DVDs we show our guests at Misty Mountain. One's called Mouldy. And it, it follows the story of a few people who got really sick, young people who couldn't even walk, and they found out it was a, it was a leaking tap. Mould behind, in the, in the <laughs> behind the wall. One lady... I guess she said she had asthma. I said, when did you get asthma? Remember, we've got, a, we've got to put our detective hat on. And Rudyard Kipling knew the importance of this and he wrote a whole poem on it. This is the first stanza of the poem. I have six trusty serving men. They taught me all I know. Their names are what, why, when, where, how and who. Do you take your six trusty serving men wherever you go? And if your specialist gets annoyed at your questions, rise, politely excuse yourself and leave and don't pay the bill. Mm. We the consumer have power. It's like I, I, I've had a sore shoulder for a while and nothing I'm doing is fixing it so I had to go a bit further and have an MRI and I discovered that I have four serious tears in this shoulder. I'm working on it, doing some herbal surgery on it, and we're getting there. See, I can move it around a bit now. And I went to the, to the doctor's surgery with my MRI, and she said, I'm sorry, she said, but my doc the doctor will not see you without an X-ray. I said, I've got an MRI. She said, he will not see you without an X-ray. I said, but there's nothing wrong with the bone. He will not see you without an X-ray. I said, well, I, he won't be seeing me then. And I rang up my husband, and I said, husband, come and get me. And the lady quickly said, oh, I'm sure he, he will, um, we'll just say patient refuses x-ray. Because if he didn't see me, what's that? Was it $180 to see him? They've just lost that money and he's going to say to his reception, what happened to that lady? Unfortunately, this speaks, yeah? He said to me, show me what you can do. He was shocked because he saw the x-ray, full thickness tear. Da, da, da. I said, if I wake up in the morning with eight out of 10 pain, he said, I, I said, I take high dose turmeric for the inflammation and I grate up comfrey root, put it on and I can get it to a two out of 10 pain in half an hour. He went, whoa. Yeah. So you know what he said to me at the end? He said, just keep doing what you're doing. And as I walked out the door, he said, keep up the good work, young lady. And he's 10 years younger than me. <laughs> How many people would he see like that? Do you know what his answer would be? Cortisone injection right in there, surgery. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I just wanted to know what he thought. We the consumer have power. Stand your ground. My husband's a fighter. He takes the bull by the horns. I'm not so much a fighter. But you know what? I've been waiting four months to see this guy. They said, we can arrange for you to have an x-ray. I said, no, I've got an appointment. It's back to back today. No, I'm... <laughs> so how do we get it out of the body? You've got to starve it. Stop all fruits. Do you know, initially, it might have to be all fruits. <coughs> Granny Smith apples and grapefruit are very low sugar. So maybe those fruits. You've got to check the house. There cannot be any mould in that house. One lady said, but it's cheap rent. Do you know what my answer to that is? Oh. Huh? <laughs> what, what, what am I to say? I'd live in a tent by a creek rather than live in a house that was killing me. Mm -hmm. Read the Bible. Read Leviticus 13. Read what God says about mould in the house. Have you read it? 
He says, dismantle it and take it out the city to an unclean space. In Australia, we call it the tip. What's your health worth? So if it is there, you've got to find out why it's there. Maybe you need to get the plumber and fix the plumbing. Maybe you need to clean the gutterings. Maybe you need to find the builder and, and see what's happening in there because there's a reason. Maybe you need to cut some of those trees down. You've got to investigate and find out why it's there because it must not be there. It's a killer. I've written a book on this subject because I find so many people are ignorant as to the dangers of mould. I was in uh, Qantas Club reading the newspaper and I was drawn to an article where the headlines were, my doctor says I've got to get out of my house. I thought, "Uh uh-huh, what's that, what's that? This lady lived in a set of apartments and the roof of her bedroom was always black with (coughs) mould. Then they began to investigate. These apartments, whoever did the tiling, didn't waterproof it properly. And then they investigated and a couple of floors up, the whole bathroom floor had fallen through. There was mould in every single floor underneath those bathrooms. Hmm? I don't know if it happens in America, but a lot of people in apartments, they don't know who's next door. They don't know who's above them, so they don't talk. And if they talked, they'd quickly find out that there's something terribly wrong in that set of apartments. You've got to investigate and find out why these things are so. If there's mould in your house, you've got to find out why it's there and you've got to take steps to eliminate it. And you know one of the best mould killers? It's called sunshine. Open up those doors, open up those windows, pull back those curtains and get that fresh air and sunshine in. So number one is starve it. You've got to turn off the tap. You've got to starve it. Number two... Kill. I do think we've got to get away from the kill mentality, but there are herbs that will kill fungus and won't kill you. Isn't God good? Psalm 104, verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. That's what herbs do. They come into your body and say, where would you like me? What would you like me to do? Garlic is a potent fungal killer. If you can't handle the fresh garlic, just... Chop it or squeeze it into a bowl of hot soup and the heat of the soup will just take the edge off. Or you can buy kaiolic, aged garlic. Um, Grapefruit seed extract. That's a potent fungal killer. The dose is five drops three times a day. Olive leaf extract. Another potent fungal killer. Another potent f- fungal killer is um, Portiaco. The essential oils are potent. Oregano essential oil, thyme essential oil, clove essential oil. I was watching a presentation by a professor. He went into a block of apartments in the Bronx that had water damage and the whole wall was mouldy. They cleaned half of the wall with bleach and the other half of the wall they cleaned with white vinegar. And once they cleaned the white vinegar one, they got clove oil on a cloth and wiped it over the whole wall. They came back two weeks later, the wall that had been cleaned with bleach was mouldy again. The other wall was not. You know what bleach does? Kills mould and feeds fungus. So when you clean with bleach, you're just feeding your next crop of mould. Plus, you put bleach and mould together and you get one of the most toxic missiles on the planet. In fact, my daughter told me of a newspaper article where the lady was cleaning her mouldy bathroom with bleach and they came in and found her dead. It was a very mouldy bathroom and the windows weren't open. So throw that bleach in the bin, it's toxic. If you have mould anywhere, you get white vinegar in a spray bottle cover yourself, spray it and get out. Come back 10 minutes later and wipe it up because it will now be dead. But if you spray and wipe, the dust is coming up and you can breathe it and and it can come in through your skin. Number three, how to get the, the fungus basic yeast out of the body. Starve it, 
kill it. One thing with these herbs, alternate. The body gets used to things. You might do two weeks on that, two weeks on that, two weeks on that, two weeks on that. They so say you can do it like that and keep alternating. Balance. Flood the gastrointestinal tract with the good guys. The probiotic. Best to buy a vegetarian probiotic. Lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidus bacterium are the two permanent bacterias in the gastrointestinal tract. All the others are made from those two. This also explains why cultured foods like your sourdough breads, like your miso, uh, kefir, yogurt, sauerkrauts, all of those foods have natural uh, probiotics the Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. Sometimes there's a little bit of a question mark about the fermented versus cultured foods. Fermented foods are foods that ferment too long and produce alcohol. Not them, but your cultured foods. In fact, traditionally, just about every nation had cultured foods. Japan, their miso, and in uh, Germany, your uh, sauerkraut, but also the sourdough bread. You see, many people get put off sourdough bread because of the word sour. Maybe more people would use it if it was called cultured bread. <laughs> and there's the comment that bread should not be heavy or sour. That is true. It should be light and sweet. And a good sourdough bread is light and sweet. Eating sourdough bread is like eating pre-digested grain. And a hundred years ago, do you know it was the only bread that was eaten? Was the sourdough bread. It cultures the grain. So all of those foods help to maintain the healthy gut bacteria. But if someone has a, has a yeast presence, they may need to take a probiotic supplement initially. Best time to take it is three quarters of an hour before breakfast, so it goes way down into the colon, which is where you want it. Number four is alkalize. And later in the week, I'll be doing a lecture on the acid alkaline balance and show you how the body runs according to precision balance. And the acid alkaline balance is important in the human body, just as important as it is in the swimming pool or in hydroponic gardening, so with the body. The most alkalizing food you can take is your vegetables, and of the vegetable kingdom, the most alkalizing is uh, the greens. When you take green drinks like spirulina, green barley, uh, um, wheatgrass, uh, kale has become popular, all the greens. We should have dark green leafy vegetables every day. The good news is when you cook greens, it doesn't change the acid alkaline. And when you cook vegetables, you do not lose the minerals. When you cook vegetables, some of the tender vitamins are killed. That's why I myself aim for half raw and half cooked in my food program. Because cooked will deliver what raw won't, and raw will deliver what cooked won't. So make sure you have greens every day because your dark green leafy vegetables are very alkalizing. There is a study today, and you will find it if you Google, showing the link between cancer and fungus. I don't know if you've heard of it. There's even a book by Dr. Tullio Simoncini, who's an Italian oncologist. I've got it at home. It's called Cancer is a Fungus. And what he does is he injects sodium bicarbonate straight into the cancer. And when sodium bicarbonate is injected straight into the cancer, it basically gives it a wave of alkalinity and it cannot survive. That's why alkalizing the tissues of the human body creates an environment where cancer can't survive, where fungus can't survive. A person can have a yeast fungus presence in their body and not have cancer but it certainly can develop into that. So when people come to our health retreat wanting help to conquer cancer, we put them on a program where they have no fruit for six weeks. They have very little carbohydrates for six weeks. So what do they eat? Lots of vegetables. 
legumes every day, nuts and seeds, and there are so many different vegetables, and there are so many different legumes, and there are so many nuts and seeds that they can get quite a nice, quite a nice diet on that. We also give, put them on these herbs, and we give them probiotic, and we give them a mostly alkaline diet, and we gather wild greens at our health retreat, blend it with water and strain it, and they have a litre of that to drink a day. So they're drinking green drinks from the inside. When they go home, they can't always do that, especially if they live in a town, so I suggest they have the green barley or the spirulina or wheatgrass. What we also do is that we wrap them up in sodium bicarbonate wraps. So I am not a doctor. I do not inject sodium bicarbonate straight into the, into the cancer. But we get two kilos of sodium bicarb, five litres of hot water and a little lemon, and we dip towels in and bit by bit we wrap up their whole body and then wrap them in blankets and they stay like that for one hour. So you can see what we're doing, alkalizing from the outside, alkalizing from the inside, and we also give them a mineral supplement called Ormus. And Ormus is orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. So Ormus is minerals that have been dropped out of seawater in a monoatomic form. And in a monoatomic form, they're easily utilised by the body and the research is now showing that it can heal DNA damage. So can you see what we're doing in the body? We're making it virtually impossible for cancer to survive. And let me tell you the story of a man that came to us with prostate cancer. Now with prostate cancer, you also do specific herbs for the prostate. And you might be familiar with them, the saw pimento and the zinc, specific for prostate. And the hormone cream also helps to balance that out. So there are a few more specifics. So with every case, there might be a few specifics. He was not really interested in being at our health retreat. He only came because his wife and his daughter were ultra keen. So he's in his 50s, his wife's in her early 30s, and everything I said to him, I said, well, we can put you on a, uh, a special program to help conquer your cancer. And he went, oh, I suppose so. But his wife and daughter were going, yeah, yeah, we will, we will. I said, we can do wraps, and he said, oh, right oh." And his daughter and his wife were going, yeah, 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 we can do them. And there's something else that we do at Misty Mountain, and that's the hyperbaric chamber. And the hyperbaric chamber is a treatment that pumps a lot of oxygen into the body, and cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. So this man reluctantly agreed and we were doing wraps on him every day, we'd make the drinks for him, and if he looked a little bit hesitant, his wife and his daughter were there, very keen, encouraging him. He was with us for two weeks. Then he went home, and I made a program for him to take home. You see, after six weeks, and in my book these protocols are all spelt out, after six weeks then he starts a little uh, sourdough spelt bread, he starts so a few more carbohydrates, and then some Granny Smith apples, grapefruit, so a little bit more. He'll be on that for two months and then start to introduce maybe some low glycemic fruits like berries. So you see, he slowly goes back onto it. Three months later, he emailed me, said, I've just had a test and I'm cancer free. Now he's interested. <laughs> he's interested now. It's an interesting story because this man wasn't that interested, but his wife and his daughter were basically doing everything for him. And now he sees the results. That's exciting. We have seen some impressive turnarounds with cancer. What I say to people that come to me that have cancer, I say, I've seen three outcomes. One outcome is I've seen turnarounds, as with this man, as with many stories I have. Number two, I've seen Three months go into six years. That's pretty impressive. Sometimes that's all that can be, especially if they've already been damaged through chemo and radiotherapy. And the third outcome is I've seen the last days made more comfortable. Sometimes it is such an advanced stage 
and sometimes the person is such that it's difficult for them to eat. It's difficult to do the specific treatments that are necessary. And we've had a few people pass a few months after they've been to us and their wife or their husband contacts and says, thank you so much. We had such a good time at your retreat. It was the best time we've had and the last days were made more comfortable. So it all depends on the stage. It all depends on how willing or able the person is to do what you've got to do to turn this around. And as I said to one man, basically the conditions we're giving your body, cancer hasn't got a chance. Remember, it is the body that heals you. What these things do is they're just giving the body the conditions to bring about healing. I'll tell you one other story of a lady who came to us. Her name's Elizabeth Cott and she was in her mid-60s. She had three tumours in her abdominal area and the doctor said, you got to start treatment straight away. This is very aggressive. She saw a video that I had done on cancer treatment so she made a decision to come to our retreat. She lives in the bottom part of Australia. She said to me, anything you do or say, I will do. So we put her through this program. She did exactly what we advised. As she went through the lectures, she came to me and she said, I've just found the cause of my cancer. I said, yes, what is it? She said, I'm Polish. I make the desserts for church. She said, I'm the pavlova maker. Do you know pavlova? What they do is they beat up lots of egg whites and sugar and bake it and it's like a meringue. Do you know meringue? And then they dress it with cream and fruit. She said, I would make mer um, meringues, pavlovas this big and I would put 16 cups of white sugar in it. She said, I realised the sugar was just feeding my cancer. Whoa. Mercy. <laughs> she had a total turnaround. She went back to her doctor three months later. She had some tests. He said, keep, see, keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in six months. Now, what had he said to her before? You've got to start chemo immediately. <coughs> Very hard for the doctor because for him to have a look at what you're doing, he has to acknowledge that what he's doing is actually not working. <laughs> and, you know, that's hard. That's very hard. There's seven years they're in university. It's difficult. And his livelihood. <laughs> Can you see the challenges? She went back six months later and the doctor tested her and he said, I, I can't understand this, but one of your tumours has totally gone. Another six months later, the other tumour has totally gone. It is two years now, two tumours have gone, one is there, it's not doing anything, and sometimes that's what they do, they decide to just stay there and they don't do anything. When I went to her town a year later, so this is in the middle of the whole experience, we went to her place for lunch, beautiful food. She was cooking all her Polish food, but instead of butter, she used olive oil. Instead of cream, she used coconut cream. So she had just replaced all the usual things to make her Polish food taste wonderful with actually healthy ingredients. And she said, when they say to her now, will you make pavlova? She said, I love you too much to make you that. <laughs> she said, I'll make apple strudel. I'll make apple pie. <laughs> I'll make lemon pie. But she said, I will not, I will not do that anymore. I went to a meeting in her town a year into her experience and just in the break she got up. Do you know she's lost 10 kilos, what's that, 20, about 20 pounds? She had her new suit on and she just read all the results. She said, I'm off all my blood pressure medication, I'm off like my sleep apnea machine. She said, I've lost 20 kilos, I don't have gut problems with you, I don't have, con she just read the whole thing and then sat down <laughs> and it was, it was quite powerful. Her story is a remarkable one. Do you know in her town now, she gives meetings. She gives cooking classes and her story is such a remarkable story. She goes to have checkups about every nine months and when she goes to have a checkup, 
She said the specialists there, the oncologists there, the doctors there, and they just stand in the corner looking at her. <laughs> they don't know what's happening with this lady. And that's, that's all she did to bring about a healing condition in the body. She eats probably like I do now. You see, the no fruit is just for six weeks. It's designed to give a sledgehammer knock to cancer cells. Doug Kaufman, he wrote a book, The Germ That Causes Cancer, and he writes with Dr. Holland. Dr. Holland said, when you deprive cancer cells of glucose, they self-destruct because cancer cells consume 15 times the glucose of any other cell. <coughs> One of the most powerful ways to bring about a healing response in the body is actually to stop eating. And the reason for this is that a huge amount of energy is required to digest a meal. In fact, it requires about 1,200 calories just to digest a meal. That's why you won't be able to run a marathon if you've just eaten a big meal, will you? Because there's so much energy going there. So when you're not eating, all that blood and energy goes to other parts of your body. And your body will go to the areas of the greatest need. It's like what happens when we're on holidays at home. I think when we're on holidays at home, we go to the area of greatest need. Is that right? Every day we sweep the floor and wash the dishes and make the bed and wash the clothes. But there are, there are priorities that aren't priorities. You know, people send me lots of things to read, so I've actually got a bit of a pile. But if I've got extra time at home, I might go to that. And that's what the body does when you stop eating. Now, before rest or regeneration or restoration can happen, the body has to clean the house. If you're renovating a house, you're not going to paint the walls till you've cleaned it. And so the body throws the waste off via four main organs of elimination. The largest organ of elimination is the skin, and we don't consider the skin to be an organ of elimination, do we, really? But Dr. Kellogg, famous doctor who wrote many textbooks on health, he said that the pores in the skin are like millions of little sewers. Ooh, what's a sewer? <laughs> Something throwing off waste. Do you know, skin is amazing because it throws off waste, but skin also absorbs things and it breathes. You know, you might have heard of the James Bond movie Goldfinger. Apparently they wanted to paint the model gold for a scene. They had to paint half her body, shoot it, take that paint off, paint the back of the body and then shoot that because you can't cover the whole body. The body, the person will die. There's the sad story of a little girl in the 50s who was painted gold for a play being an angel and she died. So your skin breathes. So it breathes, it absorbs and it throws off waste. So your skin has certain needs for it to be an effective organ of elimination. It must be able to breathe. Be very careful as to what you put on your skin. The best moisturiser is probably coconut oil, but isn't it a bit greasy? Well, it will be for a few minutes, but then it will soak in. People say, what do you put on your face, Barbara? I say, nothing, nothing, nothing. But then again, I've got probably oilier skin than most. Some people are born with dry skin, so then they would put a bit of um, uh, coconut oil. Do you know what I save on moisturisers? I spend on the best quality food, the best quality olive oil. You see the skin, the hair, the eyes are all an illustration of what you're putting in. Let the skin breathe. Also, let it have air baths. You've heard, heard of air baths? On these lovely sunny days, take the clothes off a bit as much as you dare and let the skin breathe in the fresh air. Your skin also needs water. It needs water in and it needs water out. We should be eating, at, drinking, sorry, at least eight glasses of water a day. And the best way to drink those glasses of water is little by little by little by little all through the day and all through the night. I always have it by my bed. <laughs> and the body needs to be washed every day. 
In fact, my husband and I, usually we usually have two showers a day because we've been working hard all day, so it's nice to have a hot shower, wash off all the waste before you get into bed at night. And then in the morning, we exercise and we start to perspire. It's another nice time to, <laughs> to, uh, to wash the waste off. At our health retreat, we have a steam sauna at the end of every day. So on the detox program, the guests are sweating big time. And when you go through that big sweat, 70% of body's waste is eliminated via the skin. That's why the steam bath is such an important part of a detox program. Your skin also needs exercise because when you exercise, you increase the circulation of the blood to the skin. And when you increase the circulation of the blood to the skin, it increases the body's ability to throw off waste via the skin. Now, I don't know if you've noticed that your perspiration is a bit salty. So the more you perspire, the more salt you need. So you need salt. And the salt that we use is Celtic salt. And Celtic salt has 82 minerals. Doesn't like me going over there. Be quick. 82 minerals. It's a balanced salt. So a little crystal of Celtic salt on your tongue, give it a chew just before every glass of water. So you would do that eight times a day before every glass of water. Dr. Robert Thompson in his book, The Calcium Lie, he says doing that will just replace the minerals you lost yesterday. The second organ of elimination are your lungs. And your lungs need fresh air. The more oxygen you breathe in, the more waste can be breathed out. Right now, as you sit here, you're breathing in 500 mil, you're breathing out 500 mil. But when you exercise, run up a hill, <coughs> and you start breathing very deeply, you're breathing in 3,600 mil and you're breathing out 3,600 mil of waste. And that's why exercise is very important. And it also explains why when you exercise, you be, should be exercising outside in the fresh air. And the only time to exercise at the moment is early in the morning because it's a bit hot in the middle of the day. But that early morning air is beautiful. Your lungs also need water. If it was a cool morning, you'd be able to see each other's breath because every exhalation has some moisture on it. If you're dehydrated, the little bronchioles shrink up. So you cannot get as much oxygen if you're dehydrated. And again, we need eight glasses of water with that little bit of salt before every glass. Kidneys. Your kidneys filter your blood and they do a wonderful job of filtering your blood. Proverbs 14 verse 6 states, knowledge is easy to him that understands. Let me show you how the kidneys filter your blood. This is the Bowman's capsule, the smallest unit in the kidneys. This is the little filtering unit. This is where the filtrate comes out through these little tubules. And there's the bladder where it's urinated out. The blood comes in and it weaves around these filtering units, then it weaves around the tubules. You've got one million of those in one kidney. So we have approximately two million of these little filtering units. And here's the kidney and these little filtering units are all on the edge. And these tubules basically weave, weave down like this into the ureter. There's the other, other ureter for the other kidney. And there's the bladder. In a 24-hour period, those little filtering units filter 1,800 litres of blood. We don't have that much blood. Every two minutes, 1.2 litres is being filtered. Out of that 1,800 litres of blood, 180 litres of filtrate is being filtered out. But we only urinate out 1.5 litres. Well, there's a reabsorption here of approximately 160 litres. 
Now looking at that, you can see that if our blood is thick because we're dehydrated, it's very difficult to filter. And so the kidneys must have eight glasses of water at least a day. And the kidneys must have that Celtic salt. I was asked the question, so if you have salt before every glass of water, do you have salt on your food? Absolutely. What are lentils without salt? What's a baked potato without salt? Our palate tells us we need salt, but we need salt the way God made it, mm -hmm. with all of its minerals. And in Matthew, Matthew 5, verse 13, it talks about salt. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth. If the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. So how does the salt lose its savour? I'd like to suggest that table salt has lost its savour. It's lost all the other minerals. Mm -hmm. And it's now henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. So we need the Celtic salt. The kidneys also need to be warm. Because if that kidney gets cold then not a lot of blood's going to go there. And if not a lot of blood's going there, then the blood cannot be filtered. And many people, especially young ladies, don't put enough clothing around their torso. Yes, it's hot at the moment, but where everywhere I go in America in the summer, it's freezing because of the air conditioning. <laughs> so you need to keep that, that, torso, that torso warm. And it helps to uh, keep the the waist slender because if that kidney gets cold the body says we've got a problem we can't get the blood in there quick insulate it and we don't have fur and we don't have feathers do we <laughs> what's it insulated with <laughs> yes yes so if you want to keep a slender waist keep it nice and warm so your kidney needs to be warm your kidney needs for you to be drinking adequate water. Kidneys don't like you to drink a whole quart at once. They don't like you to drink 16 ounces all at once or even eight ounces all at once. They like you to drink a couple of ounces, a few minutes later a little bit more, a few minutes later a little bit more. I just always have my bottle near me and just sip, sip. You'd be amazed how much you can get through having it little by little by little. So your kidneys need to, to be warm, they need the salt and water, and your kidneys need exercise. When you exercise, you increase the blood supply to the kidneys, and when you exercise, you move the kidneys. Look what's happening to your kidneys at every step you take. And if you're on the rebounder, and you'll discover that that's one of the most best forms of exercise, is that little trampoline. If you've got a little trampoline in your yard and children visit, where are they? They know. <laughs> Haven't they told you? <laughs> Best form of exercise. Just think of the kidneys every time you jump. And yet there's no jarring like with running. Uh-huh. It's a lovely cushion bounce. And later in the week, I'll be talking about that in more detail and what an amazing form. It's the best form of exercise, the most powerful form of exercise there is. Many people have them gathering dust in their attics or their garages. Go home, blow the dust off, and resurrect them. <laughs> the fourth... Pardon? No, it's pure water. Pure water. So the next, uh, but not water with chlorine or fluoride in it. Mm -hmm. Only microscopic waste can come out of these organs. The organ that eliminates the largest pieces of waste is the colon. And the colon has a mind of its own. Have you noticed? If you tell it to go, it won't. And if you've got diarrhea and you tell it to stop, it won't. It has a mind of its own, so it needs to be gently stimulated. So how do we stimulate the colon? Water. One of the main functions of the colon is to take water out, so stools are formed. 
exercise. When you exercise, you move the colon, and when you exercise, you increase blood supply to the coast, to the colon. Now, also, position. What do I mean by position? Let me explain. Here's the throne. And when a person sits on the throne, something's happening in, or not happening inside the colon. Let me draw the colon. You probably think I'm drawing a flower, but I'm actually drawing your colon. And there's the uh, appendix. There's where the small intestine comes in. And you'll see down here there's a little bit of a loop. And that little loop is held up by a muscle. And this muscle is called puborectalis. And puborectalis is a very important muscle because puborectalis prevents us being incontinent. And when you sit on the throne, puborectalis remains taut like that. Obviously, things can still get through, but it's held up. But if you're sitting on the throne and you have a little stool in front of the throne so that when you sit, your legs come up, puborectalis relaxes. Puborectalis, when it relaxes, opens the colon so that the contents passes with great ease. And you'll find many people in the world today, many countries, are still squatting. So it's ba basically mimicking the squatting position. And Bed Bath & Beyond sells something called Squatty Potty. <laughs> and it actually fits around the throne. Now this is great news for people who have are prone to constipation, people who are prone to hemorrhoids. Because if a person's sitting like this and they haven't gone and they decided to try and help the situation and strain, that puts a huge amount of pressure on the anus so that these horrible little things called hemorrhoids can pop out and we're going to rub them straight out because they're just horrible little things, we don't want to think about them. Mm-hmm. But when you squat, no pressure goes on the anus and the colon opens and the contents pass with ease. So it's great news to prevent constipation, to prevent hemorrhoids, to prevent pressure down here. Last, no, week before last, I met a 25-year-old man and he was about to have an operation because he had a fissula. Do you know what that means? He had, a, he had a hole here and there was a tunnel going up there. So he had things coming out the hole and out of here. He also had a lot of pus coming out of there. 25 years old. When I asked his history, it had hurt down there for a long time. And he'd tell his friends and they'd say, don't worry about it, it's just a hemorrhoid. And it's very embarrassing, very embarrassing to tell anyone or to go and have it checked out. And then he got married and he was married to a nurse and he would let his wife look at it and there was this huge swelling down here and pus and blood are coming out. Now, he told me that he would flip between constipation and diarrhoea. When he had constipation, there was huge pressure on there. When he had diarrhea, it was irritated. That told me two things. Number one, he's got irritation in here. So I said, you've got to stop the wheat, dairy and refined sugar. Do you know when he was 19, he got a job at McDonald's. What's he eating? And that actually flared it up terribly. But because he didn't know what was going on, he just didn't say anything. He told me that he and his mates went camping and they were in the bush. And they all had to go and find a, you know, dig a hole and squat. And he said it was so comfortable for him. I said, yes, you were experiencing that. And so ever after, he got a little stool. See, his body had spoken to him. Your body will speak to you. So I said to him, I, 
I would delay operations. <laughs> and what I want you to do is get two big tubs, sit in a hot tub for three minutes, sit in an ice cold tub for 30 seconds. He went, ooh. I said, don't worry, it's not going to hurt as much as the pain you've already gone through. Hmm? Back to the hot for three minutes. So it's three hots and three colds. That brought huge amount of blood to the area. I said, you must get a little squatty potty around that toilet. He still at that stage hadn't got it. But he understood why, because of his experience camping. And I said, you've got to drastically change the, change the diet. They did a colonoscopy on him where they put a camera up and they took 20 polyps, 25 years of age. And his wife's pregnant with her first baby. Oh, I praise God that I met his mother who was telling me about him and he agreed to see me. I said, if he agrees to see me, I'll come and see him, only if he agrees, because that's such a personal thing. But hey, who wants a knife in that area? <laughs> no, no one. <laughs> no one. And yet the very simple treatments. But you see how we had to come at it from two ways? One way is we've got to train, change the diet and only put food in there that will heal. And later in the week, I'll be talking about what they've done to the wheat. Mm-hmm. And you might be familiar with a little book called Temperance by an author, Ellen White. And she says in there that the devil will play with the wheat. Check it out. Check it out. So what the colon needs, it needs water. It needs the right position. Now, if you're a bit concerned because you don't have a little stool, you just pretend to be on the plane and it's in the crisis position. You put your head down here. Okay? <laughs> so put your head down there and you can basically, you will relax that puborectalis. And you look at children, how do they naturally want to go? They naturally want to squat. Yeah. So your colon needs water, it needs the right position, it needs exercise and it needs fibre. What fibre does is it gently stimulates movement in the colon, fibre also sweeps the colon. Dr. Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. He said if you eat three meals and you go once a day, you're constipated. Now you have a look at children and babies, they'll go after every meal. So what happens? Well, people go to school and they're too embarrassed to go or they can't go, except, and so the habit sets up of holding and not going. You see, we should promptly answer nature's immediate call. Mm -hmm. And if you don't promptly answer nature's immediate call, it's a panic button. Now, God gave us the ability to hold it in a crisis, but unfortunately, many people just do it all the time. Oh, they're just reading a book and they want to get to the end of the chapter. Oh, they're just typing an email and they want to wait till the end of the... Well, they're knitting, wait till they get the end of the row. They're digging a garden, they just want to finish the garden. Don't do it. If the body says go, you must go. And if a person wants to go and they're too busy talking on the phone to a friend and they want to get the end of the story, and then finally the conversation's finished and they go and they sit, and have you noticed? Can't go. Because when you feel to go, this area fills up. And if you don't go, the body, it puts it back into there. Okay? And then the longer it's there, the more water comes out. Mm-hmm. So we've got to look after our colon. And if you look after your colon, it'll do well. Hippocrates, remember what he said? All disease begins in the gut. So look after your colon by exercising every day, by using the proper position, by making sure you're eating adequate fibre. And I do not advise putting wheat germ or bran or rice bran on your breakfast. No, we should be eating whole food. The, fibre, the highest fibre food is your vegetables, vegetables and fruit. If someone is a diabetic, someone wanting to conquer a yeast problem, conquer cancer, the fruit is not the best. So what they do, they would go mostly vegetables. So your fruits and your vegetables are your highest fibre foods. We should be eating large amounts of those every day. Now sometimes people have said to me, but Barbara, 
I'm eating all that fibre every day and I'm drinking lots of water and I'm exercising and my body still doesn't go. Well, our bodies, our cells can be creatures of habit. We're creatures of habit, aren't we too? So sometimes you've actually got to get that body out of that habit. Because remember, if you tell it to go, it won't go. So what can you do to actually encourage the colon to go even when you're doing everything right? Well, there are herbs. And we have a herb mix at our health centre and we find this is very effective. It's one part cascara. It's two part licorice and it's three part buckthorn. Now, the, um, the cascara and the buckthorn are barks and the lip licorice is a root, so they need to be gently simmered. So you, all, you put that in a jar, that mix, and then you do one teaspoon of that herb mix to one cup of water. And then that's a gentle simmer for 10 minutes. Looks like coffee, does not taste like coffee. So some people love it, some people hate it, some people, most people say I can handle it. Because it has a sweet aftertaste but also a little bit bitter with those two. Cascara by itself can be quite harsh, but I have discovered that that mix is very gentle. So what those herbs do is they gently stimulate peristalsis. Those herbs restore and revive peristalsis in the colon. It's the only herb mix I know that is not addictive and the person gets to the point where they don't need it anymore. This is what one lady said to me. She was a, she was a psychologist. She said, I go once a week with help. Ooh. I said, we'll get you moving. So what we did was we uh, did, did, got a sitting in hot and cold sits bars. We put castor oil compresses on her abdomen. We gave her, in fact, she had to have three cups of this a day. Not many people need three cups. Mostly one cup at night is enough. By the third day, she was going every day. Also at our health retreat, we do colonic irrigation therapies, which is just warm water going into the colon. You know, by the end of the week, the whites of her eyes had become white. Her grey complexion was now pink. She looked a totally different woman. This woman was in her 60s. All because her colon was not evacuating effectively. She said, my mind is clear. She said, I'm a psychologist. I'm wondering whether half my patients' problems is that they're constipated. <laughs> Do you know that could be so? That could be so if the colon's not working. If you don't empty the rubbish every day, the house is not a healthy house. She said to me, that, and she got back to me, she said for one month she took three cups a day and she went three times a day. She said after a month she started to go four or five times a day so she brought it back to two cups of tea a day. That worked for another month. After another month she started to go four or five times a day so she brought it back to one cup a day and that got her going two or three times a day. After a month she started going four or five times a day so she stopped the tea. After four months, she was going by herself several times a day without help. So can you see what the herbs do? They gently restore and revive gut function. But what happens if someone's overgoing? What happens if they're going ten times a day? We've got to slow that down. We don't need that herb mix. Well, there is a herb that coats, soothes and lines the, the lining of the gut. It's called slippery elm. Remember Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for the service of man. There are different herbs that do different things. Now slippery elm coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gut. If someone's going six times, eight times, ten times a day, it means their gut is inflamed. I also find that the three, the three foods that irritate the lining of the gut 
are wheat and dairy and refined sugar. As I'll show you later in the week, the wheat has been changed. So these things must stop. They're like kerosene to a fire on an irritated gut. Do you remember I told you that the that the lining of the gut, the cells are remade every three to five days. And if you give that gut the right condition, it will heal very quickly. We had a man come and do our program and he, he only came because his wife wanted him to. I said, what's your reason for coming? He said, I'm just here to um, support my wife. But because he was doing the program, I did a health assessment with him. I said, um, uh, how many bowel movements do you average a day? He said, oh, six. I said, six. He said, yeah, I've got irritable bowel syndrome. I said, oh. He said, I'm on a lot of medication. I'm on steroids. I'm on anti-inflammatories. I went to the doctor recently and he said he could do no more for me. In fact, you know what's usually the next step? Cutting half of the colon out. I've seen that happen. He loved his scotch every night. He had several scotches every night. He loved his bread and his wheat bix and he loved sugar and he loved dairy. I said, oh. I said, would you like to try slippery on? He said, oh, I suppose so. So I gave it to him four times a day. Beginning of the day, middle of the day, six o'clock at night and just before he went to bed. He told me that he walks along the beach because he knows where all the toilets are. And he said he, on his morning walk in an hour, he has to go four times. That's just in the morning. By Wednesday, he said, I've only gone twice today. He said, I can't even remember that happening. I said, well, I think you could start easing off your medication. By the end of the week, he'd stopped all his anti-inflammatories. He'd cut his cortisone in half. And on the last day, he came running up to me and he said, I've just done an hour's walk and I haven't even gone. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> Interesting story because in the first consultation, he was not interested in stopping his scotch. He was not interested in stopping this food. He was only here to support his wife. But of course, we don't serve scotch at our health retreat. And we don't serve any of that at our health retreat. And we were giving him slippery on four times a day. The bleeding from the bowel had stopped. The cramping had stopped. And he was only going two or three times to, through the day. He couldn't believe it. Now he's going to stop his scotch. Now he's going to stop this. Because what did the doctor told him before he came to it? I can do no more for you. And he was having, he was going all that time, you know, six, eight, ten times a day, and bleeding from the colon, and cramping on the medication. Mm-hmm. See, what had happened, his body was used to the medication now. Now, I don't know anymore, because I didn't, didn't hear anymore, but... The results that he got were exciting. He won't always have to have slippery on four times a day. In fact, now that he's going two, three times a day, and now that the bleeding stopped, and now his stools are formed and not just liquid, he can probably go back to twice a day. Can you see you're the doctor there? You play with it. It's like the lady, she came to us the same thing. By the Wednesday, she'd slowed right down. She was in her 70s. When she went home, she was going twice a day, bleeding and stopped, cramping and stopped. She was excited. She rang me six weeks later. She said, Barbara, I'm going 10 times a day. So what happens now? What do I do? I put the detective hat on. I said, Laura, what have you done different? Oh, well, I only had half a slice of banana cake. What's banana cake got in it? Wheat, dairy, refined sugar. I said, Lorna, you can't do that now. But she said everyone else was doing it. Mm -hmm. 
I said, once your gut is healed, you might be able to. <laughs> her daughter had put her on a raw diet. This lady's thinner than me. She's in her 70s. What's a raw diet going to do to that gut? Just scout it out. Mm -hmm. I said, Lorna, stop the raw. Start having thick vegetable stews. Go on the slippery on four times a day. What's the saying? Go back to where you last saw the light. <laughs> Why did you do it, Misty? Bring it back under control. How do you know when you're healed? You're not taking any slippery elm. You're eating a balanced diet and everything's good. That's why you're the doctor. You're the doctor. And you might be able to make some nice banana cake with a bit of maple syrup and olive oil and uh, some spelt flour or almond flour. Almond flour makes lovely cakes. See, there are things that you can do. I make dessert for my husband a couple of times a week. Well, maybe once a week. If my grandchildren are there, I'll make it a couple of times a week. There are some delicious things that you can do without doing things that harm. God gave us taste buds for a reason. Food should taste fantastic, am I right? Amen. But it should also be such that it can give you strong bones, strong cells and nourish your body. Mm -hmm. So the colon. If, you, if our guests are on a, on a fast, and because at our health retreat they fast for two days, so we don't give them fibre, obviously, for two and a half days. We give them the cup of the herb tea at night. There's one more tiny little organ of elimination. It's called the tongue. And if a person goes on a detox and they wake up in the morning, the tongue doesn't taste very nice. The tongue can throw off waste. And there's a simple thing that you can do to pull that waste out of the tongue. It's called oil pulling. And it's been done for centuries through Europe. I've only known about it for about six years. It's putting a teaspoon of coconut oil in your mouth and swishing. Swish, swish, swish. You might swish for about 10 minutes and then spit it out, but not down the sink because the coconut oil will go hard and the plum will have to be called. Go out onto the grass and feed the microbes in the, in the soil because what this oil does is it pulls waste out of your tongue, it pulls waste out of the blood vessels under your tongue, it pulls waste out of the glands under your tongue. So when you spit it out, have a glass of water there so you can rinse your mouth a couple of times and uh, spit it out again. I'll tell you what happened to my son-in-law, Matthew. He's a builder and he was lacquering a floor. And because it was a dusty road outside, he closed all the windows and he'd forgotten to bring his mask. And when he went home that night, he said to my daughter, I just feel ill because he breathed in all of those chemical fumes. So he thought, I'll oil pull. He didn't know what else to do. So he put the oil in his mouth and swished, and after a matter of something like 20 seconds, all he could taste was chemicals, so he ran out and he spat it out. And then he did it again. This time it took 30 seconds before he could taste the chemicals. Do you know he did this over an hour? And by the end of the hour, he'd got to 10 minutes without tasting the chemicals. I would like to suggest that he effectively was able to pull most of the chemicals out. It's a very easy, quick way to detox and get waste out of your body, is to oil pull. Remember, you'll pull waste out of your tongue, you'll pull waste out of the blood vessels under your tongue, and you'll pull waste out of the glands under your tongue. I've known people to totally heal their infected gums. I've known people to heal their bleeding gums, to heal their gingivitis. Do you know it can help reduce the plaque buildup on your mouth? And coconut oil is antifung antifungal and it's antibacterial. And most decay happens because of bacteria in the mouth, pathogenic bacteria eating at the enamel. So isn't it nice when you, every time you visit the dentist, 
I visited the dentist two years ago and then four years ago. How nice, there's nothing to do. How nice. <laughs> How nice. So it's a very simple thing you can do. Coconut oil is the antibacterial compared to other oils. It's just finding a time to do it. I exercise every morning and when I come back, I have a drink of water and then I all pull, usually while I'm preparing my breakfast. That's an that's a easy time to do it. I find with these sorts of things, you've just got to make an appointment to fit it in. So it's a simple way to do a, a little detox. I always do because I fly such a lot and I'll exercise, come back and I'll oil pull. I'm amazed that when I, when I spit out the oil on the grass, how I also cough up some things and I think, well, isn't that interesting? If I didn't oil pull and didn't cough that up, where would it stay? And then I have to get a cold because you know what? That's what a cold is. It's a house clean. And all the stuff that you blow out and <laughs> cough up, it's waste. That's why they'll never find a cure for the common cold. It's a house clean. And if you handled it right, you'll get rid of a lot of waste with that house clean. And if you take drugs to repress it, guess what? You're going to have to get another house clean to get it all out. But if you can look after your body, if you keep it well hydrated, well fed, well exercised, all pull regularly, that'll really cut down your body's need to have colds. And isn't that good news? That's very good news. So the, the body was designed to heal itself. It's a self healing, self-cleaning organism. Can you see the self-cleaning here? You've just got to give it the right conditions so the waste can, can get out. And if you don't keep it clean, if you don't allow your organs of elimination to eliminate the waste, and the waste is building up in the body, then the microbes are going to have to come in and do it for you and you're going to get colds and flus to, to actually get rid of it and maybe even more serious illnesses. We have a little time before we close for a few questions. Now, if anyone has a question, I'll repeat it so everyone knows it, yes? How much, um, um, How much slippery elm? Usually you do a teaspoon and you'll do that to about half a cup of water. Now, here's the way to mix your slippery elm. You put your teaspoon in the cup and you pour boiling water straight into it while you furiously stir and you'll get no lumps and then you put enough cold water in to make it drinkable. If you put cold water or warm water in, it'll go all lumpy. And no one seems to like the lumps. Yes? Would this be good with babies with diarrhea? Absolutely. Absolutely. If babies are sick, you've got to find out, and most babies aren't eating this, so then you ask if the mother's eating it. But the slippery elm is very good for colic, but most babies have colic because the mother's having that. Yes? Olive leaf extract. O L E means olive leaf extract. Yes? That's right. With the Celtic salt, each piece is a different size. If you've got high blood pressure, go for the smallest. I probably go for the largest. It's whatever suits you. I like the course. In fact, it's the course that I use in my cooking. It's the course that I have in my little bottle in my bag that I carry everywhere with me. Um, just about everywhere I use the course. And I have a little grinder on the table that grinds it up. The fine is nice in a little shake bottle on the table. It's very moist because there are three magnesiums in it and it always will be moist. And we need that magnesium. Yes? Um, Himalayan salt? Yes. yes, Himalayan salt and Celtic salt are very similar. I think Himalayan salt has about 
minerals compared to 82 in the Celtic salt. The moister the salt, the more magnesium it contains. Be careful because sometimes they call table salt sea salt. And table salt has come from the sea, but it's only got two minerals, sodium chloride. And they're dangerous and harsh minerals by themselves. We need the whole salt. Yes? Yes, can you detox your body by soaking in clays? You can. You can. The clays, the clays have a pulling action. What about the belly button oiling? Have you heard of that? The be belly, belly button oiling, like frankincense or lavender. The, the belly button oiling? No, I haven't heard of the belly button oiling, but <laughs> I wouldn't surprise me if you put something on your belly button, it will be absorbed. Yes? Yes. Are there any remedies for um, difficulty in swallowing? One would have to investigate on the history of the person that's having difficulty in swallowing. Sometimes magnesium can relax those muscles. Magnesium is a muscle relaxant. And also the slippery elm may help. So one would in investigate as to why those things are so. Yes? Can I explain enormous again? It's orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. You can Google that. It's minerals that have been dropped out of seawater in a monoatomic form and they're easily used by the body. Research is showing that it can heal DNA damage. In my book, Self Heal by Design, and you can get my book from uh, Amazon now, and it's also, yeah, you can get it on an ebook too or you can contact my daughter in Wisconsin, she sells it. We have um, got her to send a box of books here, but we don't know when it'll arrive. This is Emma's uh, email. It's Doug Loberg at me dot com. So she lives in Baldwin, Wisconsin. So you can also, but we're hoping that the box of books will be here. Tomorrow, the next day, yes? Okay, what do you do for overactive thyroid? I'll be covering that tomorrow night when I look at hormones and candida in the gut. Candida is naturally occurring in everyone's intestines. It's, uh, and there are dozens of different species of candida. It only gets out of control if the lactobacillus acidophilus is killed off. And so what you need to do is take probiotics in the morning to get the good bacteria up that will get the candida under control. And then in my last lecture I showed how you can starve the fungus, you can uh, kill it off with different herbs, bring back the balance and alkalize the body. Yes? Hydrogen peroxide baths. That would be a lot of hydrogen peroxide. No, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Yes? Is it harm to do a salt water flush? Some people can handle it, some people cannot. And the salt water flush is two litres, a third litre um, salt seawater, a, a third hot water and a third cold water. So the person drinks two litres of that. As I said, some can handle it, some cannot. Yes? Um, probably spring water is the best, or rainwater in a healthy area. Alkaline water is also a good water. Um, if you live in an area where you can't get good water, um, you would need to put a, a filter on your tap, and you can get some good filters.
Can cataracts be removed without surgery? Yes, they can. A drop of castor oil in each eye at night. Now, sometimes the cataracts are so advanced and eye surgery, you know, it's very efficient today, but uh, if the cataracts are just starting, or even if they're half grown, the castor oil can break them down. Yes? Now, this is a very quick, very interesting question. Um, does the Celtic salt have iodine and Himalayan? I think the Celtic does. Now, very, in, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't because you know iodized salt. You get iodized salt, it now has three minerals, sodium chloride, iodine. When you open it within a day, all the iodine's gone. You see, so it's useless. It's useless. So where you get your iodine from, the best way to get iodine into the body is buy iodine, Lugal solution, put it on your skin. It'll make a brown smudge. If it goes in an hour, you're low in iodine, put, put it on every day till the brown smudge stays there for five hours and you'll have good iodine levels. So remember, iodine evaporates very quickly. So the iodized salt is useless. And Dr. Brownstein has written a book, Iodine, Why You Need It and Why You Can't Live Without It. And he's, 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 he's deemed the expert on iodine. Brownstein, yeah. B-R-O-W-N-S-T-E-I-N. I think that's it. Yes? If it stays... If it keeps its colour after five hours, you no need to do it anymore. But if you're prone to thyroid problems, then test yourself once a month. But don't do it in the evening or you'll be awake half the night because your, your thyroid controls metabolism and iodine is the thyroid's main food. So you do your, do your patch in the morning, yes? Yes, you can use the iodine from the hospital. Do you know that before a doctor um, does surgery, he cleans the whole area with iodine? Yes? Himalayan pink salt has 78 minerals, so it's better than the table salt. But I personally prefer the Celtic salt because of the three magnesiums that it has. Yes? Yeah, better deal. Yeah. yeah. And do you know doctors used iodine extensively? So, you know, it's great to have. Yes? Whatever. Yeah, whatever. It's just that ratio. They're the different parts for the herbs. It's just, it, you just use that ratio. One part, whether it be a teaspoon, whether it be a bucket full, whether, you know. <laughs> yeah? What's a good way to detox the body? A good way to detox is do a couple of days of juices and have um, fresh fruit and vegetable juices every two hours. If you're a diabetic, go for more of the vegetable juices. And it's good to have that tea every night so that the bowels are going. Good to find a steam bath, have a steam at the end of the day. But a very simple way to detox is to have an 18-hour fast every 24 hours. That's breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. So last question, yeah?
Yes, so to do the two-day fast, it's best to have a cup of that tea every night so you make sure the bowels are moving. The, at our, the juices we use at Misty Mountain are predominantly carrot, celery and apple. That's 80% carrot, 10% celery, 10% apple. And we serve them at 8, 10, 12, 2 and 4. And then of an evening we just do a thin broth. Yes, tomorrow the first lecture I'm going to give is on the liver and I will be showing you how the liver detoxes and how the liver requires amino acids. So every second juice we serve a green barley supplement and then every other juice we serve a protein supplement which is usually a pea protein or you can get hemp proteins, brown rice proteins, there's some white quite good protein powders you can use today. But I just want to congratulate you for sitting so long. Our time is up. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about the liver in the first lecture. And the second lecture we're going to be talking about how to balance the hormones.